I want to welcome you to Gardening in the Mountains, Planting Steep Slopes. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Beth Leonard. Beth moved to Asheville in 2009 and became a master gardener in 2011. She grew up in Charlotte, where she learned the joy of gardening from her grandmother. Beth landscaped her first home in Charlotte and her second home in Atlanta. She arrived in Asheville thinking that managing a garden here wouldn't be all that different from the rolling hills of the North Carolina Piedmont and the manicured gardens of Georgia. But she quickly learned differently. Her steep slope property in Asheville required a different way of thinking about gardening. Beth's presentation today is a case study of how she developed her Asheville garden over a 10-year period and what she learned in the process. So take it away, Beth. Thank you very much, Allison. And welcome to all of you on the call today. I assume that you're here because you probably live on a steep slope and you're looking for ideas as to how to manage it and what to do with it. When I think of the word planting, I really think of a set of landscape objectives. Aesthetics is one thing. How do you make that steep slope attractive? What are you going to do with it? Problem solving. Sometimes your problems might be need for privacy or removing invasive species or even a water and erosion issue. What's the purpose? How do you want to use that steep slope? What's the functionality? If you're looking for an entertaining space or even a large vegetable garden, you may be faced with installing retaining walls and bringing in lots of dirt to give yourself a lot of space. And then finally, there's implementation. How much time, money, and energy are you willing to spend on gardening on that steep slope? I live on a steep slope. And I've had to address all of those landscaping issues on my sloop. This is my house. When I moved into it in 2009, I had asked the builder not to do any planting around the house, that I wanted to do my own landscaping. And this is my house about 10 or 11 years later. So the pictures prove to you that I do live on a steep slope. What we'll cover today is we'll start with a definition. What is a steep slope? We'll talk about the challenges. What makes gardening on a steep slope different from level ground? And then I will do a walkthrough of my property. The goals that I had for different areas of the property, some of the site characteristics that I faced, and then what I did and what I learned from that. Let's start with that definition. Try to visualize what a steep slope is. One way to do that is you can hold your arm out shoulder height and think, okay, that's level ground. You can raise your hand up at a 90 degree angle and say, okay, that's vertical land. And then lower your arm about halfway. And that's going to be a 45 degree angle. And that will start giving you a visual picture of what your slopes look like. Anything that is over 40 degrees is considered a steep slope. And my property is between 40 and 45 degrees. If you're on a 40 degree slope, then you can't ride a lawnmower across it. You're not going to be able to push a garden cart across it. And even pushing a wheelbarrow or a lawnmower is going to be very, very difficult. If you're on a 55 degree slope, then you can't walk up or down that slope without handhold footholds, you'll probably be on all fours crawling up and down that slope. So what makes gardening different on a slope versus level ground? Well, first of all, I find that slopes can be visually intimidating. If you look down slope, you are actually seeing the tops of all of your plants. You get a broad perspective of everything that's across that expanse of slope. If you look up slope, then you're often seeing the underside of your trees and the underside of your shrubs. You're seeing trunks, you're seeing stems of plants. So the perspective is also different. You can feel a sense of claustrophobia or looking up slope. That sense of claustrophobia is because that hillside seems to be closing in on you. 
And if you're looking down slope, you get that sense of vertigo. So the perspectives and the intimidating factor are very different on the steep slope than a level ground where you're seeing what's directly in front of you. It's difficult to access slopes, to get up and down and around on them. That makes planting and maintaining a lot of hard, hard work. The environmental conditions are also quite different on slopes. Slopes can actually cast long shadows. So you may have sun shade patterns that differ than on flat ground, particularly if you have lots of large trees marching up and down the side of that hillside. Cool air will settle in the ravines of a slope or in the low spots. So you want to be very careful about planting tender plants in the lowest spots of your slope. Moisture levels are also different. Rainwater is often going to run off a slope faster than it can sink into the ground, and slopes can be very dry. There is an impact of gravity. With trees and shrubs that have not established a good root system, they can lean downhill, and so you may be faced with having to stake any new plants that you put on the side of the slope. Gravity will also dislodge rocks. It can actually cause pads and steps to tilt. And your flowers, they're going to flop. If you don't stake flowers that you plant all over that slope, then expect them to flop, especially after a heavy rain. In our mountains, we also experience stormwater runoff and erosion issues. I've experienced those on my slope and had to take care of them. I wish that we had a whole half day to talk about stormwater management and the different solutions that you can employ on your residential property. Unfortunately, our time today is not going to allow us to address, address all of those issues. I have provided you with links to some materials that can help you get started in terms of thinking about stormwater and those solutions. Whatever you do, steep slope or level ground, you really need to think seriously about how you're going to go about it and have a winning game plan. Know what your goals are and your needs for your landscape. Understand your problem areas. Really evaluate your environment and the lay of the land. What are those sunshade patterns, moisture patterns? What are the wind patterns? Do a lot of research about your plants. Know their growth habits. Know how large they're going to get at their mature size. That research will serve you well in terms of choosing the right plants for a steep slope. Finally, when you're ready to install, be sure you solve your water problems and build your hardscapes first. The rest of the presentation is going to focus on my particular property and what I did to landscape this steep slope. There are three specific areas we're going to cover the front, down the side and back, and then this large area off to the side. We're going to start with the front of my property. My house is downhill from the street, and the hillside, the steep slope, comes right down to my front door. This is what that property, that hillside, looked like when I moved in. It's about a 45-degree angle, and the sidewalk is about 10 to 15 feet below the street level. The issue that I had is that every time I walked down that sidewalk, I felt like that slope was closing in on me, that I was walking through a canyon. It was also just full of mulch. There was nothing on it at the time. And I wanted something that was very attractive and that would invite visitors to come down the sidewalk, that they would say, oh, this is really a lovely entrance to the house. I knew that I did not want deciduous shrubs that would lose their leaves in the wintertime. I wanted color all year round, 12 months out of the year. I also knew that I did not want a uniform planting, like a full set of creeping juniper all over the bank. While creeping juniper may be the right solution in some areas, for my slope at the front door, I really wanted a variety of plants. For my windows of the house, that's what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at variety. I wanted to look at color. I wanted to see seasonal interest. And so what was the answer? I chose to use a variety of conifers all over this front slope. Now, the picture that you see here 
shows all of those conifers in their one and three gallon size containers sitting on the bank, waiting to be planted. I want you to know how small they are. They're probably only about one or two feet tall. And as I said, the containers are one and three gallon sizes only, and things are very widely spaced. One other thing that I wanted to do, you can see on the right-hand picture, the arrow, I wanted to give myself as much width as I could between the bank and the sidewalk. So I cut back into the side of the hill about two feet. I installed a very low boulder retaining wall. The boulders are probably about the size of a football. They're stacked about one layer deep. And that created a two foot wide strip down that sidewalk that I could use to plant perennials. So while I had lots of different green colors in the conifers on the bank, I had lots of seasonal color in those perennials down the sidewalk. So it all added interest and attractiveness to that entrance to my front house. And there was a question about the front slope, which I'm assuming is outside the front door. How much sun does that get? It gets full sun. In the late afternoon, there is a grove of trees on one side of that slope, but I get morning sun until probably about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, this is that bank four years and 10 years later. On the left-hand side, I want you to notice after four years, how much all of those plants had filled in. I now had a bank full of different colored conifers. Some were yellow green, some were blue green, all sorts of different colors of green. And the perennials down the sidewalk added to that color. I also had planted four maple trees up at the top of the slope, and those provided me some privacy from the street. The ground covers, the creeping juniper that I had underplanted, had totally filled in on that bank by this time. I spent probably the first two or three years crawling that bank and made sure that there were no weeds that took hold on that bank, allowing the conifers to grow and to fill in. Every couple of years for the first three to five years, I did have to mulch around the conifers, but definitely after four to five years, that bank had so well filled in that I hardly ever have to crawl on it anymore to weed or to add mulch. At this point, you might ask, okay, what would she do differently? Well, there are two things. On the left-hand picture, arrow is pointing to a gold-thread camiciferous. After about six years, that camiciferous had grown out to the point where I had to dodge it as I walked down the sidewalk. What that told me is that I hadn't done my plant research that the size of that camiciferous was way too big for the space where I put it. I should have planted that tree up the hill, probably about eight or 10 feet, or just not put it in that space at all. What I do now is I go out every year in the springtime with a long pole electric pruning saw, and I prune off about six to eight inches of those branches. The camiciferous is filled in, it, is, it controls the size, but it is a maintenance chore that I have to go through every year. On the right-hand side, right at the top of that slope, you see another arrow. This was another mistake I made. Gravity is going to take the trailing branches of your ground covers and have them grow downhill. Those ground covers aren't going to grow uphill very easily. So you want to go to the top of your slope, the very top of your slope, and you want to plant your ground cover so that you let gravity do its work and pull those downhill. I should have planted a whole row of my creeping juniper right up there at the top of that hill. Instead, now I have to monitor it very closely for treatment of mulch and wheat growth every year. When you plant on slopes, as I've said, go small. One and three gallon size containers are going to be the best. Those plants are going to catch up real quickly to larger plants. If you are insistent upon planting a very large plant, then look at the picture on the right. This is a very large river birch. 
in order to plant something this large, what you will need to do is dig a shallow trench on the back side of the hill or the upside of the hill. Set that root hole right on top of the soil on the hillside and then mound dirt all over that root ball. So you're actually creating a berm and mounding dirt onto the downhill side of the slope. Leave yourself a depression around the trunk so that it will collect rainwater. Now, an alternative is to use planting pockets. For some larger shrubs or trees, look at the, rock, the picture on the far left. You can use large boulders and build a planting pocket, and you're basically simulating planting on level ground because you're going to backfill behind those boulders with dirt and basically create yourself a level space to plant. Now, if you've got boulders this large to put onto your hillside, you are likely going to have to have heavy equipment and professional help to bring those in. I can't get any heavy equipment onto my property. In this particular case, heavy equipment was able to come into the street above the property and lower those boulders down. But for the rest of my property, that is not even an option. The middle picture does show an option to those large boulders. You can use smaller rocks. The middle picture makes those rocks look much larger than they really are. They're probably only about the size of a basketball. But you can stack those up one or two layers deep. You can fill in behind them and plant your shrub. The orange rocks that you see above that shrub actually have a purpose. They're actually holding the bank back and they're propped against the side of the hill and they will keep mulch and dirt from flowing down and covering up the trunk of that shrub. The picture on the far right shows a temporary edging pocket that I have started using. It's not pretty, but after the plant has established in two or three years, you can go in and remove that temporary edging and then smooth off the hillside and nobody will know the difference. I go to a big box store. I buy rubber edging about three to five inches wide. I put strips about four feet long and stake that into the side of the hill, prop it up with a few small rocks, and then backfill it with dirt and plant mushrooms. Planting on level ground, planting on a slope, and some of the same rules apply. Be sure that you do your soil test. That will tell you how much fertilizer and amendments you need to add to the soil in order to have the right pH level. You want your lucid soil or your hole to be about three times as wide as your root bowl or your container and never plant any deeper than the depth of that container or that root ball. Be sure to spread out and loosen those roots and then backfill with your dirt and add mulch and water. Because slopes can be dry, you need to think about irrigation. My preferred method of irrigating slopes is using soaker hoses rather than doing a spray of water. If you spray water and you leave the leaves of your plants wet, that can incite disease. The soaker hoses actually apply the water directly to the root system. I will start my soaker hoses high on the slope. I will snake them back and forth down the slope. I can connect different runs of soaker hoses with a toggle switch. I can switch the water back and forth between the different runs so that I get 20 to 30 minute watering with each toggle switch. That gives me about an inch of water to apply to those slopes on a weekly basis. I find that it will take about an hour or an hour and a half running that water to get that inch of water. I do not bury my soaker hoses. I don't want the roots of my plants to grow over those soaker hoses. I want to be able to go back in in about two or three years after the plants have established and lift those soaker hoses and take them away so that they're not unsightly. One more about the soaker hoses. Did you say that you leave them on just for a few years until the plants are established? I do. Generally, I will go in after about three years and pull those up. 
I find that even when they get covered up with mulch over time, the mulch depresses and the soaker hoses rise to the surface. And so I really don't want them in the ground that long. Of course, these are soaker hoses, not a professionally installed irrigation system. But after about three years, I had always felt that those plants were well enough established that I did not need to water regularly. So what have we learned? I learned on my front slope that I wanted to mix my colors, my textures, my sizes, and my shapes. All of that helped camouflage the height and the extensiveness of that slope. I pyramid the plants so that I've got my tallest plants toward the center or even as backdrops on that slope. And then I layer them. So from the tallest to the midsize and the very lowest plants I want to put near my walk path or near my walkway so that I can pause and enjoy a closer up view of those plants. Do lots of underplanting to hide those stems and the trunks of plants that you'll be looking up at. Ground covers are important to reduce weeds and minimize the amount of mulch. As I've already discovered, be sure you place your creeping plants way up at the top so that they can creep down and grow over that slope. Let's pause here and see if we have any questions. We do have a couple. One is, did you have professional help with your design? I did have professional help on the front slope. I had a landscaper come in and give me a design for that front slope. I was very unfamiliar with conifers, and he took the goals and objectives that I outlined and recommended a conifer garden. Neither in Charlotte nor Atlanta had I become familiar with conifers, and I was very, very pleased with knowing that Western North Carolina has such an incredible mix of variety of plants. And so I did get that professional help for the conifer plantings. There was a suggestion about putting some of your slides in the design gallery for the Extension Gardener Toolbox, which I think is a lovely idea. What type of mulch do you recommend using that won't wash down the slope? Well, the answer to that question is it depends on how much water you have coming off of that slope. I use a double ground hardwood mulch. In most of my property, I do not find that that mulch washes down the slope badly. I find that it pretty much knits itself together and holds to the slope. There are a few areas where I do get rainwater runoff that kind of trenches and will move that mulch, but for the most part, it doesn't move. I will tell you that with gravity, that mulch gradually slides. It doesn't erode, it just gradually slides and can pile up behind the trunks of your trees. Double ground hardwood is what I use. Lots of people like pine fines. I have not used that. I do not use pine needles because they're too slippery on these slopes. Would you recommend leaving fallen deciduous leaves on the slope? I will actually address that toward the end of the presentation. So if we can hold off on that question, I think you'll yeah. get an answer. We have more, but let's just continue with your talk and we'll come back and revisit the other questions later. The next area of my property that I focused on is down the side and around the back. As I landscaped that area, I realized that if I didn't have access down the side and around the back, I couldn't guard. I needed safe and convenient access to those areas. The first thing I did was I realized I had to have steps and I had to have paths. Now, steps are going to get you up and down the slope vertically, up and down. Paths are going to get you across the slope horizontally. So on steep slopes, you're going to need some kind of combination of both. In my property, down the side of my house, I chose to build a staircase of wooden steps with even risers and even treads. I used six by six pressure treated lumber. I nailed those together with stakes and staked them into the ground. I provided landing spots every four to six steps. 
And that gave me a place to stand and look at and enjoy the plants that I had put on either side of that staircase, as well as gave me a place where I could step off into that steep slope and do any kind of yard maintenance that I needed to do. The wooden steps provided me very safe and efficient access, quick access up and down from the front to the back. Do you build your steps from top to bottom or bottom to top? Bottom to top. On the right-hand side, you see an inclined gravel path. I wanted to get a wheelbarrow from my driveway around to the back of the house. And so I needed a path. Steps weren't going to work. So I installed this gravel path to get my wheelbarrow access to the back. Now, the side house and the back of the house are both very, very shady. They back up to a wooded area. So I planted primarily with shade-loving plants that made it look very, very woodsy. I have lots of ferns, hostas. I've used flowers such as dwarf crested iris and helabores and the stilby. For shrubbery, I have used hydrangeas. I do have some native rhododendron that were already on the property that I preserved. And some of my favorite evergreen shrubs are pieris, yew, and eat berry holly. I have used all of those in these areas. This is another picture of step treatments. You can use a variety of materials. In our area, rocks for steps are, of course, very, very popular. If you don't have good equipment access to your property, then it's going to be hard to bring in very, very heavy rocks. I was able to find a contractor who was able to bring in these stone slabs via a wheelbarrow. These are only about two inches thick and about two and a half feet wide. So he was able to navigate those by hand. The middle picture shows my pressure-treated wood staircase. If you are building a staircase like this, you're going to need to dig into the slope and create level space underneath each step. Be sure that you give yourself a nice foundation of crushed stone or gravel to act as drainage for water that's going to soak through that slope. The picture on the far right is another treatment that you can use to create steps, and that would be using a rot-resistant log. These are locust, and they are staked into the side of the slope with post. You can backfill behind each of those locust logs with a stepping stone or with gravel or even with compacted dirt. Pants are maybe a little more difficult to deal with. I recommend that you spend time understanding the lay of your land, walking back and forth across your slope. You will find that there are certain undulations in that slope, the valleys and the hills, that will tell you where the natural places are going to be for those paths. The paths are built horizontally to get you across those slopes, and you may have to do switchbacks up and down the slope. In order to build your pads, think about what, what you're going to use them for. If you want to just have a very comfortable stroll through your garden, then you might want a pair if it's about three feet or four feet wide. But also realize that you can get good convenient access with just a goat pass. A goat pass of about one foot wide will do just fine. Know where you're going to put in your pads, dig out the side of the hill, take the dirt from, that you dug out from the side of the hill and level off your pairs and then use rocks or even pressure treated timbers to hold up the downhill side of that path and keep the materials from rolling down the hill. You can stack those rocks one, two, three levels deep. Try to knit them together as tightly as you can to act as a stabilizer on the down slope side. On the uphill side, install rocks or timbers with the purpose of holding the bank back. And that will keep dirt as well as mulch from rolling down and covering up the materials that you use in the middle of the path. 
I started using hardwood mulch on my parents and found out that it decayed too fast and I was having to replace it too often. I then switched to wood chips. I never found a really good place to buy and have wood chips delivered. I have now moved more to using gravel and pebbles, and I have even used tall fescue grass seed and grassed some of my paths and installed stepping stones. So there are different materials that you can use on those paths. Install your paths before you plant. Be aware of where and how you need professional help or heavy equipment to get in and out. Be aware that wood steps are probably going to have about a 10 to 15 year lifespan while rocks are going to last forever. That helps you evaluate the incremental cost of both. Be aware that the downward pressure of a slope may tilt steps or even cause paths to sink over time. My wooden steps after 14 years, I can tell a difference in the tilt of those steps. They're not unsafe. They're not unstable. But if I put a level on those steps, they probably are no longer purely level. We are now off to the side of my house. This large area, when I moved in, really had no big plan for that area. It's anywhere from a 40 degree to 55, 60 degree slope. It's about a quarter of an acre, and it also is below street level. When I moved in, I thought, okay, I think I'm going to let that become a meadow. I tossed out ounces and ounces of wildflower seeds, and I said, I'll just wait. I have a beautiful, very colorful wildflower meadow out there. But I had been in the house about a year, and I looked out my kitchen window, and the picture on the left is what I saw. The wildflower seeds had not germinated, maybe one or two, but certainly not ounces worth. And it was an ugly, weedy mess. Anytime I walked out there, I had to thread my way between weeds that were four and six feet tall. It was just a total affront to my sense of order and my idea of a well-managed garden. So one day I got out there and I started pulling weeds by hand. And I had gone about five or six feet into that area and realized that there was a very heavy undergrowth beneath those weeds of grass. That told me that there was no way I was going to go out there and broadcast an herbicide and kill all those weeds. Being ever aware of erosion issues, I did not want to leave bare soil in an area that was that large. So I reconciled myself to pulling those weeds by hand and hiring two dump trucks to come and take all of those weeds away. So for the next year, my husband and I spent time pulling those weeds and going out on a bi-weekly basis with a string trimmer and cutting back the grasses that had grown up underneath the weeds. After about a year of doing that kind of work, um, I decided that I really needed to build my access paths, build my rock steps, just make it easier for my husband and me to maintain that particular area. I still thought, okay, with the right attention, I could have a wildflower net. I also wanted to be able to go out and sit and enjoy a book, watch the birds, listen to the wind in the trees, and maybe have a glass of wine. And I said, okay, I think I will just build a patio. By this time, I had decided that I would never be able to use that quarter acre as an entertainment space. I was not willing to spend the money to build huge retaining walls and backfill with dirt, or I wasn't going to spend the money to build a decking system. So this patio was going to solve my need for just getting out in nature and sitting. I found a relatively level area that I could then carve out the side of the hill and build that patio. And you can see in this four-foot stacked stone retaining wall that it is actually curved 
around the curvature of the hillside. I have a nice little six by 10 patio in the middle of that steep slope. Another year passed and the developer of the community came in and sold the lots that were beside my house and the hill above my house. At that point, I realized, okay, all of the surrounding forest is gone. Everything is now opened up. Although I love my neighbors, I really wanted more privacy on that side slope. So I decided that I needed to go in and pay lots of attention to the very top of that slope, right at street level. You can see that on the right-hand side, those arrows. At the very top of the slope, I decided I needed a very dense planting of trees and shrubbery. I installed Nell H. Stevens Hollies for their evergreen foliage. I installed oak trees for their height and for the canopy that they were going to provide to hide the house in Bosnia. Then I went below the hollies and the oak trees and installed a variety of native shrubs. I used Farthrigilla, Clethera, Hydrangeas, and hybrid azaleas. I had about a year, and I kept looking out my kitchen window at that slope and saying, okay, what's going on? Is it how I want it? Is it the garden that I want it to be? I realized at that point that my pathing system had actually created some very horizontal structure and horizontal lines on that slope. I realized that it had actually cut the slope into three very distinct areas. I had an upper slope, a mid slope, and a lower slope that was defined by the patio. The slope was also becoming increasingly shady, where initially it had been all sun, the tree canopies around me had filled in so much that now I really only got sun in the middle of the day for about four hours. I also realized that the pathing, the forked paths that I had installed to go into that area actually started acting as an entrance way to a garden area. It made me realize that the focal point of that whole side area was now the mid slope and that it was going to need attention. But before I could do anything else, I had to solve another problem. That problem was when I walked across the upper path between the upper hillside and the mid slope, you can see right there where those arrows are. I always felt like if I made a misstep, that I was going to tumble all the way down the side of that hill. So I needed something that would give me a visual border so that I felt safer and more secure as I walked across the upper path. I didn't want to add a fence. I didn't want to add any more retaining walls. I said, what about a living border or a living hedge? I decided to plant a row of juniper shrubs interspersed with Camiciferous and Whipcord Arborvitae. Then I installed a Japanese black pine right in the middle of that mid slope to give me a focal point. This is not a great picture, but if you look across that slope, you can see where I have planted those conifers as they grow in. They're now probably about two and a half or three feet tall. They have provided exactly what I wanted them to do, that living hedge or that living fence. Now I needed to turn my attention to really planting that mid-slope and making it a welcome entrance to that side of my house and that garden. I widened the path. I extended the low retaining wall. Both of those things provided additional structure and additional entrance to that garden. I needed to camouflage the verticality of that slope. And so I went into the middle of the mid slope and added winterberry hollies. They would provide me with beautiful red berries in the winter time and a contorted branch structure. And then they provided a nice view through to that lovely Japanese pine that I had planted behind. 
I underplanted those winterberry hollies with Japanese painted fern. They could tolerate the shade. And by the way, after many tries with perennials, I found out that they were about the only thing that I could plant in that particular space that seemed to fill in and work. I came to the entrance of that path and said, what I really want is color. I have green everywhere in my property, and there I want color. I decided to do an, a, a large perennial bed. Down close to the path, I planted the lowest and the shortest perennials, helibores, hookera, anemone, barren wart. At the upper edge of the slope, I planted my taller perennials like Siberian iris and goldenrod. I've also got Shasta daisies and echinacea. In the middle, between the low plants and the high plants, I did a row of abelia. The abelia served the purpose of hiding the stems of those goldenrod, which I wanted as pollinators. The abelia hides the stem of the goldenrods and the rigid branch structure of that abelia also acts like a stake to those goldenrods. Then in 2020, COVID hit. I was stuck at home and I had time on my hands. I kept looking at that slope and saying, okay, what do I want to do now? I really liked the look of the perennials and the retaining walls and the mid slope. And I said, let's duplicate that on the upper slope. So I went in and installed three more retaining walls, back filled with good dirt, and planted three perennial beds behind those retaining walls. I actually have three different perennial beds based on the sunshade patterns that I have. One of them is full sun, one of them is full shade, and one of them is part sun, part shade. So I actually have three different perennial beds styled in that upper slope and certainly below the native shrubs. The developer of the community came and resurfaced the street above me about that time. I had never had water runoff down that hill before, but it changed the direction of the water that was coming from the street of the slope. Not a lot, but in a heavy rainstorm, two or three areas started creating their own little divots or trenches. I have now gone right up to the lip of that slope and installed a very heavy planting of Pacassandra, which is serving to slow that water down and spread it out and help it soak in before it rolls over the slope. You mentioned Pachysandra several times. Which Pachysandra do you grow in your garden? I will admit, I am not a native purist, and I am using Japanese Pachysandra, which is not a native. I have had a lot of success with it. I was just reading the other day that Georgia considers Japanese Pachysandra an invasive species. I don't find that it has done anything in my yard except fill in the spaces that I want it to fill in. If you're a native purist, go ahead and try Allegheny Spurge, which is our native Pacassandra like plant. Thank you, Beth. I realized that there were still some forgotten corners of that side yard that I had never paid any attention to. I wanted a few little mini gardens. I added some stair railings beside my rock steps. This picture on the right shows a mini garden of hostas. In another area on that slope, I have a mini garden of day lilies. Maintenance in any garden is never, ever maintenance free. They always take some amount of work. But over time, as your plants fill in, as your ground covers fill in, and as you take care of your problems, it does get easier and easier. It always helps to plant with navies. And choosing those plants, particularly on slopes that aren't going to require you to climb that hill and do pruning. Weed often. I go out about once a week and walk the property and come back in with a small bucket full of, of weeds, uh, not very often any longer. I recommend that everybody become a student of leaves. Know which leaves are weeds that you want to get rid of. And which leaves are things that you want to save. As I would walk my property and look for wheat sprouts, I discovered some leaves 
of things that I knew I wanted to keep. I discovered flame azaleas that were coming up on my property. I found two oak trees, white oaks, when they were about two inches tall. And I said, these are in perfect places. I left them and they are now 10, 12 feet tall. I found an American holly that had volunteered itself. It has grown now from a two inch sprout to a 15 foot American holly. So know your leaves. Mulching becomes much easier as those plants fill in. Fall leaves, we had a question. I initially tried to get all the fall leaves off of my property every year. I have now decided that no, that was a lot of work. I have found two or three places on the property where I will allow those fall leaves to simply accumulate. The native shrubs don't seem to mind sharing the ground space with fall leaves at all, and your native perennials are going to pop up through those leaves come spring. The places where I do take care of removing fall leaves are on that front bank, the conifer garden. I want to make sure that I blow all of those leaves off of the creeping juniper every year. I don't want the leaves covering that creeping juniper and smothering the trailing branches. Besides, I like the green color and it makes it look nice and neat. I do watch particularly my hybrid azaleas and I will go in and pull the leaves out from behind those shrubs where they tend to accumulate and can smother out those branches. But for the most part, I am starting to experiment more with leaving those leaves on the ground and not totally getting rid of my fall leaves. This was my 13-year transition from a weedy, weedy side slope to a totally different garden. I did not want that side garden to look like the conifer garden in front. I wanted it to be very woodsy, very natural. I wanted it to look more like Mother Nature had planted it and not a landscaper. I went slow. I did not have an end-to-end -end planned when I started, but I did go slowly and I worked different sections at a time. And I let each section inform me as to what worked, what didn't work, and what was going to drive the next section that I needed to plant. Gardens are not static, and neither are we. Your gardens are going to change, the environment is going to change, and we are going to change. And so a garden essentially is never done. I realize that I will probably stand at my kitchen window one day soon, and I will look out at that garden and I will think one more thing that I need to do to create a change. That is my story of gardening on steep slopes over a 14-year period. I will turn it back to Allison to see if we have any additional questions. Well, this has just been fabulous, Beth. There's been a number of comments about the ideas and the inspiration that you've been providing for us all morning. Thank you so much. There was quite a bit of traffic in the chat box about the stacked stone walls. Did you do all that work yourself? What kind of advice and recommendations do you have about that? I will admit that no, I did not stack those stones. They do take practice, and I have used several different contractors over the years to do the stack stone. I will say that the first contractor I did, it was probably the first stack stone wall he had ever done. It was an, an experiment and a learning process for him. I found others that created nice stacked stone walls later on. Because everything on my side slope had to be carried in by hand with no equipment, they always used small stones. Actually, stones that I would have had no trouble picking up and carrying in one stone at a time. You can imagine the amount of time that it took to build any of those. With each of those stacked stone walls, they dug down into the soil probably a good four to six inches. They installed a base of gravel and sand and then built the stack stone on top of that. 
one of the things that they all attempted to do was to create the stone so that you don't stack pieces vertically, but you overlay them and interweave them so that you have upright pieces to hold horizontal pieces and that you have different size stones. They liked using a capstone on top of each of those walls to provide some stabilization to those stones. They also showed me that it was very important to lean those stones backwards toward the hill. I now have a couple of these rock walls that were installed too vertically, and the downward pressure of the hillside has started tilting them down slope. I'm going to have to go in and dig and replace those. Canting those walls backward toward the slope does help stabilize them and prevent that downward tilting. Between labor and materials, I know that we're never going to be able to nail down a cost. And there are a couple of questions about that. Are estimates based on linear feet or height or how does that work? Yes, to both. The contractors that I used measured linear feet and then estimated the height of each of the stone walls. My stone walls are no more than a foot and a half tall. That's how they calculated the labor. And then, of course, the stone itself is priced by tonnage, by the pound. I have probably brought in, I don't know how many tons of stone into this yard. But yes, the calculation is based on linear and vertical feet. If you're working with a contract, you're going to find that there's local stone, there's stone that comes in from Tennessee, from Virginia, and different stones have different prices. All of that gets factored into that cost. What kind of wildlife issues do you encounter in that beautiful garden you just spoke to us about? Well, the bears do occasionally like to walk through. I have plenty of birds. I keep going out every year and counting bumblebees and honeybees. Are you asking about snakes? Yes, every year I do see a couple of snakes wandering through the yard. I have never seen a rattlesnake, although I know that they are all over our community and our mountain. I found one copperhead a couple of years ago. Other than that, I've never seen a copperhead, and I know they're all over the community. I am always cognizant, pulling weeds and working around all of these rocks, that I have lots and lots of good hiding places on my property for snakes. Early on, when that side slope was primarily the weeding nest, I did see, gosh, I don't know what to call them. I don't know whether they were voles or some kind of the old mouse. They were pretty big mice, if they were mice. But over time, as I've worked this slope, all of those problems have been eliminated. I have never had a problem with voles. I do have moles. And I have just simply learned to live with the moles. Yeah, they dig holes in the ground, and I've just learned to live with them. They don't particularly bother me. We do not have deer in my particular area, so that's not an issue. We do have rabbits, and the rabbits only seem to bother my rudbeckia. I have lots of rudbeckia in my yard, and the rabbits bother the rudbeckia. I bought these little spiky nets that claim to keep rabbits and cats out of your garden. I have cut them and put them on the ground and let the rudbeckia grow up through those, and that actually keeps the rabbits out of the rudbeckia when they used to eat it to the ground. That's about all I've seen in my yard. This has been a wonderful morning. I just so appreciate Beth Leonard, you joining us this morning and sharing your garden and your wonderful adventure. It's just so inspiring. And your photographs are gorgeous and everything looks really nice. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I put a couple of links to the Master Gardener website for upcoming events and activities. We're very busy in June talking about garden bugs, both good and bad, pollinators, all kinds of great things. So stay in touch and have a good day.